So I imagine that we have all heard, either met or heard stories about those people called know-it-alls. These are people who are not just intelligent, but need everybody to know it. It's not sufficient to be smart. They want everybody to know they're smart. They're not happy for a conversation to end with someone else making the good and right point, but need to add something else on top of that truth just so that people are aware that they know stuff. And the problem is that they are more interested in simply knowing than using that knowledge to benefit others. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul addressed a similar kind of person concerning the issue of whether Christians could eat meat that had been sacrificed in pagan temples. So the issue here was that these for, the Corinthians, being former pagans, had previously participated in this idolatrous temple worship and had made these very sacrifices to false gods before they became Christians. So in pagan areas like Corinth, people brought various sacrifices to the temple, which was so prevalent that temples often sold the the sacrificed meat in market-type areas, much like a a butcher shop or or even serve it near the temple in a a restaurant-like setup, and people could go and buy it or, or dine there. And given that the Corinthian Christians had been previously steeped in this idol worship, it was difficult for some to separate buying sacrificed meat from the acts of devotion to these idols that produced the meat. Some Corinthians objected that Christians know that there's only one true God, which means that these idols are just made up things in people's imaginations. Since then, they aren't real. The meat sacrificed to them is is just normal meat, especially since it was usually cheaper than the other meat sold in the market. So, though, as with many issues throughout this letter, Paul didn't have a straightforward yes or no answer for them, but one that has many layers to it um, that essentially continues through chapter 10. Now, in chapter 8, Paul argued that the Corinthians need to have theological understanding, but they also need to implement that understanding with love. So, in first, or in, in verses 1 to 6, He established the principle of doctrine applied in love, and in verses 7 to 13, worked out how that looks for this particular situation for them. So, the main point is that true theological principles require love. True theological principles require love. We're going to think about that in three points, doctrine, disagreements, and Development. So, doctrine. Remember back, if you can, to the the beginning of chapter 7, and Paul began there to address issues about which the Corinthians had written to him, so he'd gotten a letter from them, and and now he's responding in this long section um, to those issues. And the first issue in chapter 7 was about marriage, and the phrase, though, this is, this is why it's important, the phrase now concerning opens each of these topics. And at 8.1, the topic changed to now concerning food that has been offered, sacrificed to idols. So just like in chapter 6, verse 12, and in 7, verse 1, it seems that the Corinthians had a, a slogan that they'd been using, to which Paul was responding. So, here their slogan that that the ESV has has put in quotation marks for us is, all of us possess knowledge. 
That's their slogan. Now, Paul did not deny that they know things, but he responded that this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So so in other words, they may understand things, but they are not using that knowledge like Christians should. Whatever knowledge the Corinthians have here, it filled them with prideful arrogance. They are not, we're not building up fellow Christians in love, but are using what they know to deride other brothers and sisters. So in verse 2, Paul explains it a bit more explicitly what he meant here. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Now notice, right, this is really pointed that Paul said, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he was pointing out how it is so easy for for people to get fixed on a a theological principle and, and asserting how right they are, but when we behave that way, we actually reveal we don't understand our theology. If our theology does not result in treating others in love, then we actually don't understand our theology at all. We've imagined that we know something. Now, on the other hand, Paul said in verse 3 that if we love God, then that shows that God knows us, which says that being in relationship with God is the knowledge that counts. So, think of, here's a, here's a few verses to, to fill this out a bit. So, think of John 17:3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. Know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In Galatians 4, 9, Paul explained how our knowing God is is simply the other side of God knowing us. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world who's Slaves you want to be once more. Or even, even further, Romans 8, 28 shows that God knowing us is related to the doctrine of election. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Which means, okay, for, for 1 Corinthians 8, 3, that Paul was saying that Our love for God springs out of His knowledge of us in election. And the point here is that loving God is more fundamental than simply being able to articulate a a theological position. Hear me, look, really hear me. The distinction is not, the distinction is not between love and knowledge. Those are not opposed, but about how true knowledge produces true love, which means knowledge without love is not true understanding. Paul said, you think you know something, but your lack of love shows you totally missed the point. If you don't love, then you don't know your theology. So think of it this way, right? If, if you are arrogant, especially with other believers, have you really understood your sin, or what grace is, or how you came to know any theology in the first place? 
No. A true understanding of your place before God humbles you, which means if you aren't humble in love towards other believers and others, but especially towards believers here in this passage, then you at least forgot if you ever knew your theology. So then, having established theology, knowledge is proper functions, as he, as he described elsewhere, the, the pastoral charge to teach true doctrine in 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, the aim of our charge, the aim of our charge to teach the truth is love that issues from a pure heart and, good, and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So having established that, Paul returned in verse 4 to the point the Corinthians had used to defend eating meat that had been sacrificed. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. The Corinthians said, look, the Corinthians said, look, it doesn't matter if our food was involved in idol worship because those are just statues that don't really exist since there's only one true God. And the logic of that follows, right? Uh, look, we, we know that God is the only true God, so some guy sacrificing meat at a pagan temple is no different than some other guy slapping my meat against the tree in the woods in some religious ceremony he's made up, of which we've never heard. That wouldn't bother us. So why should this? You know, in verses 5 to 6, what's interesting here is that Paul agreed with their theological point that God is the only true God who, who truly exists. And he said that that's, that point is true. There are plenty of supposed so-called gods, but, but none of them are real. Loads of people claim their idol is a god, but, but we know that there's only one real god. And that seems to be the obvious teaching in, in these verses, but we need to look more carefully at verse 6 and, and how important this is. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Now, this verse is, is really fascinating, actually. All of them are, but... Yeah, you know what I mean. This is especially neat because uh, it's become famous in, in lots of studies about Paul's understanding of who Christ is because this verse is a reapplication of Israel's most foundational creedal statement about the one true God from Deuteronomy 6.4. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The clear affirmation is that the Lord God is one, and Paul redeploys this confession that the one God is both one God and one Lord, the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we can't go so precise with the terms as to say that God and Lord are separate identities, because, in, in a really strict sense, because the real point is that Paul combined Jesus Christ and the divine Father, that these are both entangled in the one God's identity. Doctrine about the true God should produce love for God's people brings us to our second point, disagreements. Right, the, we've, we've worked sequentially 
in the last point, through these verses, tying them to other Scripture and showing that, that Paul agreed that the Corinthians were theologically correct, that idols don't truly exist as gods, but that they were not using, the Corinthians were not using that knowledge in love, which undermines their claim to know the truth so well. And this point looks a bit more carefully uh, about how we might think about applying the truth in love. Now, right or wrong, Reformed people are known for being angry <laughs> about doctrine. We have, we have a reputation for precision in doctrine, which is good, but also for being antagonistic towards those who, who disagree with us and sometimes who just don't know as many things yet. I mean, there's this phrase, right, about a cage stage Calvinist who, who has just embraced Reformed theology, and, and now they're rattling the bars. They're on the warpath to tell everybody about their Calvinism. And I think, yeah, I think in all honesty that Reformed and Presbyterian churches can often be I don't think it's as true as, as people say, but I think we can often be weak. Now listen, though, by being more vocal about what we oppose than what we love. So I'm not saying it's wrong to oppose things. We should. I, I think it's well and good to argue against error. But we should be really vocal about the truth we love and in that way not just vocal about the things we don't like. And I, I admit that that's a particular temptation of, of mine to be vocal about what I put. One, one of my friends who, who read my book that releases later this year said he would describe it as forceful. Maybe that's all right in an academic thing, but, but I really hope that forceful does not characterize me as your pastor or as your friend, and I hope it's not how people first think about you either. So then, we need to think about how we combine being passionate about true doctrine and loving those who disagree with us or, or who just haven't learned some things yet. And I hope you heard, I, I hope you heard that I said we have to combine good doctrine with a presentation in love. I'm, I'm not advocating that we dilute our theology. If, you, if, if I hear you say that, that Harrison says we should neglect doctrine for love, one, I think nobody who knows me well will believe you, um, and two, <laughs> I mean, you're breaking the ninth commandment at this point because I've said the opposite. We have to combine truth and love. And, and I think that that forces us to ask the question, why would we get angry about the truth? Why, why should we be mad about the message of grace and how we practice our relationship with God. Now, I understand there's such thing as, as righteous anger, and, and that there are times, truly, that we, we need to be clear that we love Jesus far more than we love any other person. Really. Which means that we may have to hurt feeling. I mean, especially in church discipline, right? If that ever becomes a thing. We love Jesus more than any one person. But we have to avoid profaning Christ's name among the nations. Still, most of the times, we miss a step here if, because our vigor and anger are in personal conversations when people disagree with us. 
And I'd put it to you that our theological anger and, and insistence on certain principles at others' expense tends to be more about our pride and, and getting our way than about God's glory. Disagreements then show us where our love really lies with ourselves or with God. Which brings us to our last point, development. So we saw first that good theology should result in loving God's people well. And then we saw that it is easy to turn the truth about God into a way to promote our own glory by showing how articulate we are about the truth. And now we need to think and see how this certainly challenges us to consider how we implement our theology, but, but also encourages us with strength to do that. Now, at least for me, I imagine others are in the same situation. I mean, it can feel overwhelming to, to think about the responsibility to, to balance knowing the truth with implementing it in love properly. I gravitate towards emphasizing being correct, and once we've demonstrated who's correct, then that settles the matter, right? You've heard me. What argument do you have? So just do it. <laughs> that, though, is not exactly how God treats me. And God is always correct. God does not simply assert His truth and leave His people in rubble. He deals with us gently. We continually get it wrong, even when we understand what is true, and yet still the Lord is patient, merciful, and gracious to us. And that shows us how, how God is the great example of how we are called to be too. He does not crush us with the truth and leave us to get ourselves in order after we know the facts. He, he teaches us carefully as a parent teaches a child. And our, our development is learning to combine good theological principles with robust Christian love, and that is grounded in how God treats us. And so obviously that, that points us to, to Christ as our example in the Christian life, but He is not simply our example in the Christian life. He is also the foundation of it, the primary example of how God did not merely demonstrate the truth and leave you to sort it yourself is the Son's incarnation. God could have shown Himself just in sending each and every one of us straight to hell. No questions asked, no second thoughts. The truth about God is demonstrated. The truth would have stu stood firm, in that case, by God's justice and righteousness being magnified. But God, who is rich in mercy, sent His Son, who is full of grace and truth. He certainly, Jesus Christ certainly taught us about good doctrine. He was also so patient with His own disciples as they took forever to understand who He is. And He's patient with us too. He came to teach us and to die for us. He gave His own life so that God could redeem us from the consequences of our sin. He gave His life and rose from the grave 
so that he could give new life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. He gives us new life so that we might live well for him. And he gives us new life so that we might love as he first loved us. Let's pray. Father God, we do rejoice that you give us new life in Christ, and we pray that as we understand that more and more over each phase of our lives walking with you, that that would abound in rich love for you, for our fellow Christians, for the world around us. We pray that the truth would take root in such a way that that we're not angry, that we're not more about what we're against than what we're for, but that the truth would grip us in such a way that we are excited to talk about what we love because the truth has produced such a deep love within us. Help us to be that way. Grow us. Help us to treasure Christ and what He's done for us, the fact that He has not just asserted what is true, but taught us and helped us, and help us to be more like that. We do pray these things in His name, for His sake. Amen.